Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 2020 SCCM Congress Co-Chairs. Well, good morning and welcome to day two of this year's annual Congress. I'm Michael Dubik and I'm here with Joy Howell and Jose Pasquale and we are your co-chairs for the 2020 SCCM Congress being held in Orlando, Florida next February. You've heard how talented our colleagues are who are members of the Congress Program Committee. As always, the, the committee tries to outdo itself each year by planning an even better educational program that you're experiencing now. Well, believe it or not, next year's program is gearing up to be even more spectacular. We started planning the 2020 Congress program in the fall, and we've reviewed some excellent session proposals last week. The latest technologies and information relevant to critical care will be delivered to you in Orlando. The information that we need to deliver the best possible care to our patients will only be presented at SCCM Congress. So we invite all of you to join us and encourage your colleagues to join us as well in magical Orlando. Next year's Congress will for the first time feature a collaboration between SCCM and other critical care societies. This collaboration that is called Critical Care Week will bring together important knowledge, skills, and resources all in one location that will help us deliver better critical care. Joining us at Critical Care Week will be the Federación Panamericana Ibérica de Sociedades de Medicina Crítica y Terapia Intensiva, which will hold some sessions in Spanish. Other organizations are designing joint educational sessions with SCCM as well, and are bringing leadership to Congress, which will also put additional details and important projects working with us. Watch for additional details between now and next February as this new collaboration takes shape. And now watch why you should join us in Orlando.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. William Dager. Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce this morning's Peter Saffer Memorial Lecture. Dr. Paul Pepe is an exceptionally accomplished MCCM clinician scientist with over 500 publications, including many diverse and landmark papers, such as the Chain of Survival Treaty, Auto Pete, Permissive Hypotension in Trauma, Reappraisal of Mouth to Mouth in CPR, the Chicago Airport AED study, and the first translation of Heads Up CPR. His grassroots, highly successful track record for planning and implementing a systems approach to prol prolific life-saving, both operationally and through many successful clinical trials, has supported his long-standing mantra, the earlier the intervention, the better the results. He has been cited for heroism in the US congressional record and has frequently received national and international awards from numerous multidisciplinary organizations. He has been de designated a master for the College of Physicians and when receiving an award for lifetime achievements from the American College of American Emergency Physicians in 2005, he had already been cited as the most accomplished emergency medical service physician of our generation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pepe as he receives the Peter Saffer Memorial Lecture Award and presents a 2020 vision of CPR, evolution, revolution, and novel solution. Thank you. Thank you. So, good morning, good morning, good morning, my good friend. So, I was trying to be Jean Louis Vincent or something like that. It didn't work too well. I was once told that my French accent was the worst one anybody has ever heard, and that's true. So, hey, good morning, everyone. And before I get started, I wanted to um, um, just play one video, it's just a case report, typical case report. Um, and it will probably, I think, set the tone for today. And here I go. The patient has a fractured fibula on a mild sedative, probably could go home tomorrow. The patient has a fractured fibula, mm -hmm. given a mild sedative, so he could be able to go home tomorrow. Daddy's gonna be so excited. Daddy's gonna be so excited. Thank you. That killed him. <laughs> that's gonna yeah that's i hope the kill the talk doesn't kill that kind of thing we'll see how it goes so i just wanted to be first of all i was really i'm since i mean this quite sincerely i was very flattered that i was asked to come and be the speaker especially in terms of peter saffer it just it's just mind-boggling to me obviously there's no accounting for taste nowadays but then i found out that um, apparently there's some, I don't know, what do you call it, like a clause, an affirmative action clause within the program committee's bylaw that says for every attractive, articulate, charismatic speaker you get, you, there's a certain, every few years you have to have a certain percentage of people who are, I don't know, how do they put it, uh, uh, aesthetically challenged, okay? So here it is. So I was actually, then I was actually kind of hurt by that, but I have to admit I was in a uh, TV news god this is a big audience this gives new meaning to distance learning huh out there great so any <laughs> wow he's hey, by the way thanks for getting up at this hour and being out here with me today so anyways i'm in this network tv interview and um they have this thing called wardrobe and makeup or something and they immediately call for backup so maybe there was something to it i don't know we'll see all right let's get on so 
I, I think probably the screening process for this was to get someone you know, who had been here for at least a third of a century, and I made that. I, I found my old certificate. Look at that. Lee Thompson, John Downs, you know, Diane Adler. 20, that's going to be the end. Look at 220. So my anniversary is in two days. It's going to be kind of fun. So it does show that I'm an old guy, and there will be a lot of old jokes as we get through this here. But here's what I used to look like. I told my daughter that I actually had six-pack abs way back when. She says, well, you got a kegger now, Dad, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, but this is me and my brother in Joe Savetta's shop back at Jackson Memorial way back in 1982. And so I started off, for those who don't know what I do, because I don't know what I do half the time either, um, I started off as a critical care specialist, training with great people like Glenn Cobb and Len Hudson, et cetera. And, um, but what happened was I was kind of lured into the pre-hospital setting uh, by Len Cobb, who was starting a program of something called paramedics in Seattle way back when. And they asked me to go out and evaluate and maybe come up with new things. Uh, they actually said they had talked to my boss and they said something to me. I didn't even know, I'd never heard the expression. They said, that they said that I think outside the box, and I had no idea what they were talking about. And so the guy who, Dr. Mike Kopis, who took me on, said, personally, he said, personally, I don't think you've ever been inside the box, okay? So I didn't know if that was an insult or a compliment or both, but I took off into the streets and started helping them out uh, in those streets. And it was kind of an interesting experience, by the way, and I uh, started learning that had an, it just took me out of the ivory, cat, ivory tower, as they say, and really put me into people's homes and realized that the beginning of critical care for them started the moment the event happened and they started calling in. And the whole theme here of continuum of care led to, as we'll talk about later, the chain of survival issue. But I did begin, as we just heard, I didn't even know they were gonna put this in the introduction, so it works, is that I started developing a, and I, as I talked here in the early 80s, I don't even remember what year it was. I think it was Chicago. Uh, the problem with getting old, there's two things. One is you, you lose your memory, right? And then the other thing is the... Um, um, I, I don't know. Did I tell you about the memory thing? My, my doctor put me on memory pills, but I, I forget to take them, right? Boom, right here we go. But um, actually, you know how you know you're getting old? Is when you come home and uh, tell your spouse, your partner, whomever... Uh, Honey, um, I'm having an affair at the office. And he or she goes, really, who's catering it? Okay, so, all right, all right so let's move on. So my mantra has been that an ounce of good pre-hospital care has, can save a ton of ICU care. And for those of you who are outside the continental United States, that's a gram of good pre-hospital care can save a kilogram of good ICU care. So that set me up for ACLS. Everybody knows what ACLS is, right? Well, in my case, it's an alternative clinical lifestyle, okay? So I took critical care of the streets, and that's the theme today. And the earlier the intervention, the better results. And you'll see some examples where an ounce of good pre-hospital care has saved a ton of ICU care. And that brings us to why we're here today. This man right there, Peter Saffer. I was absolutely blessed and honored to be uh, basically uh, someone who not only got to know him, but actually spends some time with him, not like many others in the audience. I, by the way, it's just so cool to be here with so many old friends here, emphasis on the old part. And, um, but it really is really wonderful because there's people who really were very close to him. His accomplishments, everybody thinks that in terms of doing the mouth-to-mouth -mouth part for the CPR and being one of the clear fathers of CPR. But he had so many people in his lab from almost every country in the world. He has made significant contributions to people that I absolutely respect and adore. I saw uh, you know, people like Sam Tisherman yesterday, so the surgical thing, or Sandy Schneider there, uh, who was in emergency medicine. And they've all been incredibly accomplished people and all with the same common denominator right there. But he did other things where I worked in the disaster realms out in the streets, well, because he was doing it a long time ago as well. This is uh, some of the data from the Club of Mines way back in the 1970s. As you see, I'll talk about Fritz Ottenfeld later on. And then also, there it is, the International Society of Disaster Medicine. He was doing things before I even knew how to listen through a stethoscope, and it was really incredible. And not to get too parochial about it, one of the things that I really uh, latched onto is that he, and this is one of his protégés, Nancy Caroline, started the Freedom House program of ambulances to give people jobs, to help a new, and get a whole new area of starting pre-hospital care. 
And it was just an amazing thing. And she went on to do things that are even to this day read as standards of care for paramedics, et cetera, out there. So I was very fortunate to uh, get to travel with him at times, uh, let alone be on the stage with him and just learn from him as we had our meals and so on. And here we are in the, uh, on the Great Wall of China. I think it was back in 1989, etc. By, by the way, this wall, I think, was meant to keep us in or something like that. I don't know what that was about. But in any event, Peter, uh, that's supposed to be a joke. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. I'll tell you what, if I tell a joke, I'll put a J side up so you know when to politely laugh, etc. So, But um, it, it was kind of cool. But I could go on and on, but I'll tell you one thing. I, I'm fortunate, I'll never achieve anywhere near what he has done, but, and done for us, and will continue to do for us through many people who was his, were his protégés. And, uh, and, but one thing I did learn is apparently I do have some embedded DNA that goes along with him. I was checking into a hotel one time in Washington, D.C. for a conference, and I pulled out my wallet to give them the credit card. So I pulled out my credit card and I, I have a little thing with a rubber band like this. And this lady said, that's so bizarre. And I go, well, sorry, you know. And she goes, no, she says, I've never seen that before, but I've seen it twice today. And he said, well, he says, one other man came in and did the same thing. And he said, well, who's that? And she says, it's that man over there. And she points to Peter Saffer, okay? So I thought, this is so cool because I was actually one, people don't know about the Saffer advanced technique for credit card containment and safety, okay? And I'm so glad that I grew up in a similar, apparently there is some cross linkage. Apparently I was gonna check that DNA thingy there. So it was pretty cool. All right, I'm supposed to be here to give a talk. So what about that evolution, revolution talk thingy that I'm supposed to do, right? So there are four inevitabilities of life. What, death, taxes, kale, and uh, disclosures, okay? So I have absolutely, as you see this stuff today, I have absolutely no disclosures made except that all the coffee beans are, won't make me a morning person. So I may wake up somewhere in the middle of this talk as we get through this. Now before the main talk, um, I do wanna say that there are many technologies out there happening. There are new things we're doing in the laboratory that will raise the dead. Literally, people who've been down for 15 minutes. That may be for some future talks. But I'm going to try to see what I'm going to show you what I think we'll be doing in 2020. But on the horizon right now are things like Pulse Point that get a hold of you if you, there's a cardiac arrest and they notify it. We're using TE, transesophageal esophageal, um, echocardiography to show the right positioning of doing CPR. Uh, you know, you might even be your head, your hands might be over the aortic root. So to know where the optimal place to get the best ejection can be guided by that. Um, things like Reboas to help redirect things when there's vascular collapse out there after no oxygenation going to your vascular tone out in your tissues. And ECMO, of course, is already becoming a big thing. We're taking to the streets like here in Paris with my friends there in the Louvre, okay? That's why Mona Lisa is smiling, I think. And um, we've actually had some incredible success, like Dimitris Yiannopoulos, one of the people I work closely with, got 42% people with refractory VF back, where it used to be five or 6% at three months, et cetera. And I think one of the most telling things is that one of our own, a critical care cardiologist, Joe Arnato, chairman of emergency medicine, was saved by his own system of care. As the paramedics picked up and he said, PE, VCU, where he worked, ECMO, and it all happened, and he's alive today and doing well. So here's the cognitive roadmap for today. Review the focus on the quality of CPR. That's been the trend for the last two decades. Monitoring compressions in what we call the sweeter spot. Analyze why we need both evidence-based medicine and experience-based medicine, and being wary of fake news and resuscitation. And then also discuss adjuncts to enhance flow. Uh, sometimes I entitle this talk, don't mind the pressure, go with the flow, okay? And you'll see as we get through this. And then finally, some revolutionary dyes coming full circle. And I use the term revolution not because we're making some major changes. Well, we are, but I actually think of revolution as coming full circle around the sun, so to speak, coming back to the basics and making things happen, but maybe in a new way. All right, let's go on. So a lot of this should be, I hope, deja vu all over again for you, but we'll make some new teaching points to get here. I like my pants pretty good, huh? So cool. Here's my glasses, I got them here in the pocket somewhere. Okay, so a lot of this started because of the recognition of sudden death syndrome. Ventricular fibrillation took a lot of people down, in, both in Seattle and later in Houston, 
uh, in over half the cases of people who we resuscitated back in the 70s, there was no evidence of heart muscle damage whatsoever. These were people just having an ischemic event, having an electrical event as a result, and going into cardiac arrest. But if we got them quickly enough, we could make a difference. And that's where Dr. Cobb was bringing me in to help bring this to the streets and help see if we can get these people back. And they were young people, relatively speaking, not necessarily a disease of the elderly. We've made some great advances. And one of the things you've heard about, I think, is public access to fibrillation. And we got our first clues that maybe this could be a possibility through this <laughs> thing here. So anyways, let's go up. So we did do, uh, I think for me, in some respects, there's a couple other things we've done in the streets, but one of the clear things that really brought home my concept that the earlier the intervention, the better results, was the public use of external defibrillators, such as the study we did at the airport in Chicago. In that first year when we put these in, they'd had no survivors for over three decades, even though I mean, essentially not. I think there may have been one or two anecdotes, but no survivors at the airport in Chicago, despite a dozen a year, and almost all of those are ventricular fibrillation, by the way. And um, despite that, uh, the paramedics not seeing there was nobody coming back. So the year we did this, we put these in, we get, you're about a minute brisk walk apart, maybe a minute and a half. You're pretty close to them within 30, 40 seconds you get to it. In our first year's experience, nine people went down in the ticket counter and, and uh, gate areas where we put these things. And um, of those, how many think survived, okay? No survivors for several decades, now we put these things in there, right? How many think survived in that first year? I got a bid here for six, okay? Any other bids? I hear any of it. How many you got? You got a five? Got a fiver? Okay, anybody else? Sorry, I can't see you guys in the back. So let me see if I can bias your answer a little bit, okay? Six had never seen an AED before. They may have heard about it, but they never were trained or seen, okay? So how many you think now? Yep, you're right, all nine survived, okay? And what was more impressive was that we reached steady endpoint before paramedics even arrived in most cases. They were waking up. Uh, the next year, we didn't have, not everybody got saved. There was a few people with a refractory VF. They were interesting because they were obese diabetics, which left to a, a new interesting hypothesis generating thing, which I won't cover today. But the point is, people said that this shows that public access to fibrillation is good, it can do it, let's do it. It said to me that this is a highly reversible process and the, and the ounce of pre-hospital care can save a ton of ICU curves. These guys didn't get to even go to the ICU. They were in step-down units because they were awake. I do, we do have a pro new program though. If you get three or four defibrillations, you get an upgrade, to free upgrade to ICU, so, okay. So, the good news also is that we always had these problems and today, all I have to do out into the community with people based on what I just told you as an example is that know where, it, only you have to know two things, know where it is and go get it. And then just turn it on and follow the instructions, okay? And that's what's so cool. We're making things simpler, easier, and technology is helping us get ahead. All right, so let's see, chest compressions. So not everybody needs an AED but everybody probably needs chest compressions and cardiac arrest. And what we've learned about chest compressions over the last few years is that they're critical to resuscitation. And specifically, one of the things we found about them, some great work being done in laboratories, including people right here in the front rows, where basically work in which you can increase the, uh, your, your pressure head up to maybe 20 millimeters of mercury. That's not quite getting to what our normal coronary perfusion pressure is. And then you stop it to give a breath. And this was like typically what they would do for kids and may have had a lot to do with why kids don't survive, et cetera. Then we went on to this 30 to two ratio and the assumption was that the two part where you're giving two breaths was very quickly and you would basically get it back. Well, in fact, even with people who are really highly trained people, well-skilled people, it takes about 15 to 16 seconds to get this done. So that kind of led to this whole thing about not interrupting compressions at, at all, you know, in these particular cases, all right? And the key of early findings from things like the NIH rock were that the chest compression fraction, that means there's much time, let's say over a 10 minute period, how much time did you have your hands on the chest? 
if the chest compression fraction was at 50%, you weren't doing very well, but you get up to 70, 80, 90%, you did better. So the concept of minimally interrupted compressions came on and everybody knows about uh, chest compressions without uh, breathing and so on is that was the new thing. And that led by 2010, and this is part of our evolution, to get to the point where we talked about push hard, push fast was really the way to go. So one of the solutions at that time apparently was this. With the new CPR jackhammer, now you'll not only meet, but exceed the American Heart Association guidelines for compressions. After all, don't you think more is better? Deliver an average of 3,542 compressions per minute with the new CPR jackhammer. CPR jackhammer, because more is probably better. Probably, yeah, right. Well, maybe not. And one of the things that uh, we did as with part of our rock group, the, the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium, in fact, in our shop, we were very interested in looking to see, did that change change some of our outcomes uh, by doing, because we went from 80 to a, 80 to 100 a minute to like over 100 or whatever it might have been, or at least a minimum of 100. And we found out people were really pushing hard and fast, okay? And when we looked at that, it turned out there was a sweet spot of CPR rate. In fact, not only was the, I wish I can show you on the, um, uh, like, a, like a pointer here, but what it shows here, let me just show you the area here, that even at 80 to 100, you weren't doing too bad, but once you got up at 120, it has an interaction with depth, it has an interaction with the recoil, and as a result, survival rates went down. So it made us a little worrying, but we've actually taken a step further. Not only, we got a high piece tech of equipment called a metronome to make sure that would help us guide us, and we ended up doing better. But it made us go back and question some other things. One thing was a thing called the impedance threshold device. If you don't know how that works, it's kind of interesting because it's like a, um, well, let's say if, you, if we do a compression, if we think about the thoracic pump model, you're doing a, like a turkey baser thing, you're squeezing the blood out, et cetera. Then when you release it and recoil, it's a suction occurs and you pull blood and air into it. But what if you were to hold the air from coming in so it doesn't neutralize the pressure you, uh, in, the, in the thorax and you just go, mm, mm, mm. it's like trying to suck through a milkshake and it actually tugs a little bit more blood in. So uh, it's a nice idea, you just, it's about, I don't know, little 16 centimeters of water pressure just for a blip for a second, but enough to pull some blood in. And so that was done, and a very elegant study was done by the NIH, I mean elegant. Uh, they had no advantage in survival as they did it, and the reason why I say it was elegant, everybody got an ITD. It was very well blinded study, half of them were activated and half were inactivated. So, uh, you know, and so it was just really well done. It was NIH, it was a uh, multi-center, multi-country uh, program, didn't show any difference. In fact, to get into the study, you had to show that you were doing quality CPR uh, through some of your records ahead of time as you did this. At the same time that was published with the same first author, there was another study where the ITD was combined with the active compression decompression pump. If you've not seen the active compression decompression pump, it kind of looks like a toilet plunger and it's actually sometimes called toilet plunger CPR for whatever, yeah. You know, and what happens is you're getting a compression and then a decompression that helps suck more blood in. And I'll show you an example of this. I actually took this video myself in Paris in the military um, uh, place there and we were using it as a prototype early on. And that's the inventor, uh, Dr. Keith Lurie, uh, doing this. And you can see it gets compression. And this is going to become, we'll talk about this maybe towards the end of the talk as well, because it has something to do with what, where we're going in the future. So this Lancet study had a favorable neurological outcome, 150% improvement in one year neurological. So what's the difference? Why was there a discrepancy? Was the ITD just a you know, a passive device and it has nothing to do, doesn't make any difference, or does it need the other thing to work? You know, what's the story there? Well, let's go back to this thing about the quality of CPR. It turns out in, when you go back and look at the data, and these were all prospectively collected in a very specific way, we had data and actually looked at the quality of CPR. We had, we had actually rec electronic recording of the quality and rate and depth of CPR. And we found is that probably even using very liberal criteria for quality of CPR, 
it turned out maybe only 20% of the people were getting full quality CPR. Some people were getting the right rate, but they weren't getting the right depth, et cetera. And so we actually went back and looked at it with respect to the ITD, and this is raw data. I wish I can point this out to you better, but what you're looking at at the top is an active device, and the green line at the bottom is a um, inactivated device. And when you're at that 100 to 109 point, it actually made a tremendous difference. It may have been worse for you if you're going too fast, et cetera. So that gives us a clue that maybe something was going on. So you can look at this as data dredging. We went back and uh, said, well, it is prospectively collected data and we addressed the new question. We, we took it further and looked at the whole thing. We looked at it in terms of depth rate and so on um, in this paper, quality of CPR. And we said this was an important effect modifier. And to take a step further, the latest question we asked is using that same prospectively collected data set. We went back and we said, well, since rate and depth interact with each other, they could affect each other. Let's see if there's an optimal combination, a sweeter spot of CPR. And so this is a paper we're about ready to send in. And I not only asked the question, is there a sweeter spot with rate, an optimal combination of rate and depth? I wanted to know, does that change? Does it change if you're a man or a woman because there's different anatomical differences? If you're older or younger, if you use a device or not, et cetera. Does there any, and several other questions we applied this to and we stratified for all those various things. What this does show you though is, this is kind of a cool way of looking at it. It's called the contour plot. It's like your weather thing. And what you see here is that um, at the bottom uh, on the scale on the right, it's zero survival rate, neurologically intact and you can see those blue areas. And as you move up to the green, those are like 5% survival rates, et cetera. But you look into the red zone on the right with the active ITD versus the standard CPR, you're getting almost a doubling there. It's over 10% surviving uh, going home. What this says to me is that the elegant study done by the New England Journal is, and so on was absolutely correct, that the ITD doesn't make any difference at all. If you're not accounting for if you're not accounting for the quality of the CPR. But if you, and this also says that this ITD thing does work if you're doing quality, but it's highly dependent on it. Could even be harmful if you're not using it correctly. So we really have to develop systems in which we are delivering CPR. And this goes right back to Peter Saffer just, and Dr. Len Cobb, who just said, the most important thing you can do is doing good compressions and doing them right. And they were telling me the right numbers back then. We're finding out that about 4.3, 4.5 centimeters, whatever it is, and a rate of about 107 if you wanted to use something that works, and it works across the board for every one of those conditions I was talking about, which surprised me. I thought they would be different. But that's, not, that's all not peer-reviewed. Don't take it home yet, and we'll see. So maybe not such a neutral trial, but I think Tom Alterheide, who was the first author on both of those papers, and I actually since have written a paper and said that one of the problems, we, it was unrecognized confounding variables, like probably overzealous ventilation back when we did high dose epi studies in the past, or it was, you know, whatever it might be. If someone told me they did a study on AEDs at the airport and they didn't find any difference, well, my experience would say, yeah, something's wrong with that. You say, well, when was the first shock given? They go, well, 10.2 minutes versus 10.3 minutes. Well, no wonder you go. So I've come to the conclusion that we're always saying something's good or bad. And, and then we have opposing camps and people get enemies. So Tom and I wrote up this paper called EBM Experience Evidence-Based Medicine, which we absolutely say you gotta have, versus Experience Medicine, Medicine which says us the, maybe we need to research things again. I love this one. This is um, Anakin Skywalker, you know, as he's heading off and says, if you're not with me, you're my enemy. And, and look at Obi-Wan's reply. Okay. If you're not with me, then you're my enemy. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. So only a Sith deals in absolutes. So it's not that the ITD or the AED is good or bad. It's how you use it when you, like TXA thing. Let's say if you assume the crash two study was a correct. At one hour, it can be very life-saving. At three hours, it can be detrimental. So we've got to approach things in a multi-dimensional mode. And my big push here is that research should be spelt research. We've spelt it wrong all these years, okay? So let's go on. And it should be integral not only to EMS, but also to excellence in critical care. So that was kind of old hat. Let's move into a new realm. What else? How about the concept of gravity-assisted CPR? I have to make a decision almost on a day-to-day -day basis for rushing people in for ECMO now or for transplants. We're gonna get them off the scene. 
if I'm going down a stairwell from that bedroom, should I tuck the head down or should I tuck the head up? Okay, good question. So the average person, when I ask that question, says, well, Trendelenburg, right? Let's put them in Trendelenburg and you'll get better flow and all that kind of thing. Well, you know that uh, when it comes to me, don't judge too quickly, whether it's the ITD or this. So welcome to the typical fun day at the existential fun park with me. Why are you here, okay? Because do not believe everything you think. We go on to this, the potential flaw of, of CPR as we do it now. Don't get this wrong, this CPR works. It saves lives. Peter Safford can be very pleased to know that millions, if not hundreds of thousands of people have been saved by CPR probably today. But there is some potential flaws. When you're doing flat CPR, as I do the compressions, I'm injecting blood both to the arterial side and the venous side at the same time, increasing arterial and venous pressures in the brain. And you could even say that compresses the already ischemic brain, brain hammering, etc. So it, it, there's maybe that component. So that's a theoretical concept. But either way, it's an, it doesn't flow as well because you're getting intracranial pressure up. So your arterial flow probably wins out, but it doesn't basically work as optimally as it could. So a person that I've come to work with, again, no conflicts of interest here with her at the University of Minnesota in Hennepin uh, is Johanna Moore. And we've been working in the laboratory on a concept of how can we pull more blood out on the venous side? And guess who would understand that better than anybody else? You all right here, because you understand intrathoracic pressure regulation. They, a lot of the people who are out on the streets don't, get a, don't have a clue about that. I was fortunate to work with, when I was doing like the auto peep work or the, you know, work with Len Hudson and learning how to use PEEP and then finding out that just even regular positive pressure ventilation can cause a problem and you have to have swings. We're working in Joe uh, Savetta's laboratory, so to speak, in the, at Jackson, learning that you have to have negative intrathoracic pressure swings. So we said, what if we could pull blood out of the brain and back into the heart? And one of the things that we can use to do that is basically not only gravity, but some other things. Remember I told you about the ITD? The ITD enhances that vacuum. The suction cup, and here is a Lucas device, which is a mechanical uh, suction device. In other words, it's the same thing, but it works with a suction uh, thing. And we look at it whether we do it with an angle. So here we go. This is a 30 degree CPR uh, head up thing. And on the left side, we see supine and the aortic pressure is maintained. And we've looked at, this is at 30 degrees. We found out in the animals that we could do 10, 20, 40. 40 was aortic pressure drops off. So this is all, but it's not arbitrary. Look what happens to ICP. Just totally goes way down. Cerebral blood flow goes up. That's a, per, I mean, perfusion pressure. That goes from, that doesn't look so impressive, but it's 75 to 100, okay? And then when we did gravity, what I call CPR aggravated, you actually put that head down and look what happens to ICP. It goes even further and your cerebral perfusion pressure goes down lower. So how about brain blood flow? Well, we actually did studies, same thing. And then these, in our early studies, we were looking at microspheres and guess what? At minus 30, zero and 30, the blood flow is much better, et cetera. So it's not just the pressure, it's the flow that's increasing. Does it work without the ITD and ACD devices or whatever it may be that we were talking about those ITD and that compression thing. Well, one study that we just presented last year, we haven't written this up, but what we looked at was you could see the over here in cerebral perfusion, it's coronary perfusion and then cerebral perfusion. And the cerebral there, you see that the combination of the two is much better than zero. But if you took the ITD off and did the Lucas device that automated machine with the suction device on it, if you took it off, it fell off. So we knew that these things were interdependent, and that, but here is the, I think if you remember one thing from this talk, you're looking at it right now. And that is cerebral perfusion pressure with the head and shoulders up. We found out later, at first we were doing kind of a straight reverse Trendelenburg, and it probably is better with the, the legs being flat, not even up, but just flat. And we found that the chest and head were better, which I'll tell you about in a second, but part of that is in pulmonary mechanics. It probably decreases, we've seen that it decreases pulmonary vascular resistance through the chest. But this is the most important slide because, even though I can't point to it, what you're looking at at the bottom is, this is cerebral perfusion pressure, and you see it going way down after we put the animals into a rest. Then we begin CPR, and this is over 20 minutes. And look at that thing on the bottom, that purple line on the bottom, if you're not colorblind. Um, is that it goes along and then next thing you know, cerebral perfusion pressure starts falling off. And largely because to some extent you're becoming vascularly 
<laughs> losing your vascular tone, your perfusion, pressure heads going away. If you do head up, guess what? It's a little bit better, but it falls off too and it's not quite that great. If you have just the active compression, decompression device, the Lucas device and the ITD, look what you get. You get um, a much better perfusion, but it's sustained. But here you go, you put the head up, those other things that help pull everything out of the brain, etc. And look what happens. It is not additive, it's synergistic. It's an important bundle. When I first did what I'm about to show you, I said, this is a historical control. But then I realized it really was the introduction of the bundle because we, we added one last piece and it made a difference. So it's kind of an interesting thing here. And this is kind of why you need to remember this. So we did look at the, all these different angles and it becomes important because the next study I'm going to show you is just reverse trend Willenberg, but it turns out we think we have better ways of doing this now, okay? As it's a work in progress for sure. So what about survival? Okay, so we, uh, I was um, actually um, giving, I have a big conference that I run, in fact, I'm doing it in a couple of weeks up in Dallas, and I was giving the first reports of this a couple of years ago at our meeting, and uh, was giving the same results here. And then all of a sudden these two young champions from down in Florida come up to me and say, we wanna do this. And I'm going, didn't I just tell you, we gotta be real careful. We think it's, and just to make sure it's clear, we actually think it's harmful to do this. You know, put the head up if you don't prime the pump first. And if you're not done in a certain way, it's, it's, it's a, it's, there's a lot to this. I was saying, we haven't even done feasibility studies to see if you could put this machine on at an angle on a human, and you know, humans are different than pigs, and blah, blah, blah. And they're going, well, we want to do that. I said, you're going to have to have a Lucas device and an ITD on every unit to be able to do that. And he goes, we got them. And I go, okay. <laughs> so I went and talked to my comrades in the lab, and we said, why not? We may learn some, and we did. We learned a lot during this period of time. So we're just doing a feasibility, whatever it's called, clinical feasibility and safety study here. And we went ahead and did it. And it was down in Palm Beach County, which I thought was like a lot of rich people. Turns out it's amazingly huge. That's like Palm Beach, okay? We're talking about this huge geographically expansive area with a different diverse population. And they were doing pretty well, despite the fact there wasn't much bystander CPR going there. They had pretty respectable rates. This is a very matured system, well-trained. They're doing good. They came up with this idea about putting this plastic case there, you know, whatever. And um, so I said, sure, let's just do this. We'll, we'll see what happens. So the resuscitation rates on a monthly or quarterly basis, I don't know what that, I think it's, yeah, it's by month, uh, over 2014, been pretty good. This is, this is all comers, asystole and everything, getting people alive to the hospital. About 40% of those is in retrospect in select hospitals that we were able to get the data from survived neurologically intact. But so it's a, it's a and it's remained that way. So here we, here's what we did. So in January, I give my talk in February and we start doing the changes in March April, May, et cetera. And look what happens over the next few months. Boom. We're doing nothing different except putting the head up and maybe we were teaching them a little bit better how to do the CPR and the pit crew and putting this machine on quickly. They had already had them. So there may be that component of the historical control of the, whatever, the, the study effect of the, you know, and all that. But this was profound. It really happened. I was the first person to critique it. But then as we started doing the stuff in the laboratory, I just showed you when we looked at the, con we found out this thing is synergistic. I'm going, wow, we're adding that last piece. So I'm actually a little bit more convinced that this works. This is the, actually the paper that was just published Friday. Um, it comes out and it shows here what we were doing by quarter. And you can see the average before the transition was about 18% resuscitation rate going all the way up to you know doubling that. And look at the range, those are not just standard deviations, the range of resuscitations. It was profound and it was sustained. So it was pretty cool. So the nice part for me is that the absolute number of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest patients resuscitated by EMS in 2014, 2015, et cetera, is going up and those people are going home. And again, 40% of them going home. There are literally several hundred people alive today now that it's 2019, uh, thanks to this technique. And they're doing some other things down there as well. So whether you say this is hmm, this is just shows that clinical safety and feasibility, et cetera, uh, I think it's a bigger step forward. And this was just literally put out on Friday and it's gonna be in our March issue of critical care of medicine, confirming the clinical safety and feasibility of it. What I will ask you to do, do not go home and try this, right? We have to still work this out. Please, please read the discussion. I carefully wanted to write a thoughtful discussion 
and it goes through a lot of the things about the different components that was that were get went into this and the various limitations of each one and what we'll do better next time around. I'll give you an example of what we're going to do better. So we've learned that perhaps the head and chest up likely works. It likely improves neuro outcomes, by the way. And um, it depends, though, on the uh, having those other components there as part of the bundle. And both head up and chest up are probably better. And lowering ICP has become a new key focus for me, OK? That kind of thing. And that's part of it as well, but not ready for prime time. Right now, we are doing a thing called the RICH study in which we're actually looking at this. And I can, it's totally preliminary data. We only have 39 patients, but it already looks like we're going in the right direction there as well, that it may be better than the machine. Again, you may lose something in that. You've got to make sure people are continuing to do it and you switch out people regularly. So that's number one. And we do it at an angle. The other thing is, is this thing that's being, I don't even remember the name of the company that's making it, but we're using it in the laboratory. Again, we have no conflict. We're just testing this stuff. So the concept came up is to look at head up CPR and do it in a, so we put this thing on at a supine thing for a while. And then after several minutes of CPR, we go ahead and elevate this slowly over two minutes as we're priming the pump. And we're getting that same curves. And this is a new one where you can put the machine on. I, I haven't even seen this thing yet. They're just, I think it might be a salesperson or something. But in any event, I want you to notice something. See this thing up in the corner? This is from Friday. Sorry, I don't have today's results, but this is our last pig, okay? But what this is showing you is that we have about eight minutes of VF, then we're doing the regular standard CPR. And as we're getting on here, what you, I won't drill down, there's not enough time here. But as we go through here, we're increasing VF amplitude, we're increasing entire CO2, we're getting almost normal perfusion rates, normal aortic pressures with this. It's pretty phenomenal and it's really exciting and we've seen it happen. And look at that, it's really, this is the same thing you saw before, but with this, uh, it's called the Elegard, I think is what they call them, the, the, the brand name for it. So in the future, what's gonna happen? So my prediction, my 2020 vision, is my, what my ophthalmologist said, I have no vision, it's very poor, but you know, but my vision is that, you know, that we are gonna be looking at synergistic bundles. One of the things I told you about to read about in the discussion is that we've always looked at things one by one in ITD or epinephrine or whatever, and sometimes correlating people with univariate analyses to make decisions about what's evidence. And it may very well be that we need to, like we do with cardiology or we do with uh, things, these things are different mechanisms that are trying to accomplish the same thing in different ways, but they're, they basically are interdependent and they are synergistic when you're working together. So it's not necessarily a new paradigm, and that brings us full circle on the revolution back to Peter Saffer, okay? So uh, you heard they said that I had this paper, the chain of survival paper. Well, that was based on something I did in Seattle, I mean, sorry, in Houston in 1982, they introduced an educational metaphor for the city council members. But where did I get it from? I got it from this guy right here, okay? Peter had told me about the so-called Redding's Keta, okay? And uh, he had told me about the concept of the linkages have to be there, that the bundle has to be there, that you had to have rapid bystanders doing CPR, that you had to have a good pre-hospital team at the hospital. You could have a great hospital, but no bystander CPR, or you could have whatever. So in bottom line is that the concept of a bundle and independent things to make everything work is not essentially new and it sort of came out of the great people. And by the way, being the humble man that he was, Peter, basically, we have come full circle because he gives it even to his people that he worked for, his mentors like Fritz Adenfeld, who actually described the Redding Skepta back in Rescue Chain back in 67. So maybe it's really, once again, not evolution and revolution, it's a re-evolution that we're seeing here today. And on the road to 2020, uh, uh, I hope that what we're doing here today will make uh, Peter proud, okay? And um, I will say this is that, if I can get this next slide thing, we may get back people that we never thought we'd get back alive, et cetera. And, um, and before I do say that, I just say that my p-value, I was showing a slide yesterday, my p-value was 0.06 compared to what that guy got accomplished. But I hope that having learned from us, myself and the other people in the audience who are doing great work will continue um, to do the same thing. And with that, I want to say I'm Paul Pepe and I approve this message, okay? So thank you very much, everyone. So 
I've been asked to say, I'm not gonna take questions to the audience, but I will meet people. I'm gonna go up to room 22 up there. I could be at the table if anybody has any questions for me. And by the way, thank you for what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm up there, you're my favorite heroes, okay? So thank you again, all right? Thank you.